Hi, this is Dr. Kate Crowley from Teachers College, Columbia University in New York City. This webinar series is going to look at evidence-based practice in identifying language disorder for purposes of the disability evaluations under IDEA 2004. This first module, we're going to look at what the law says, the federal law says about how to do these assessments, and number two, what does the research tell us about how to do appropriate disability evaluations to determine whether a language disorder exists. So I'm going to focus today on native English speakers or bilinguals who are not considered L's by their school districts. So they either never were considered L's or they passed out with some proficiency test. Uh, I continue to do a lot of work with bilinguals, but I wanted to make sure that this particular webinar focused on native English speakers and children, students who do not receive um, L services, no bilingual classrooms or no uh, ESL services. I'm going to talk a lot about leadersproject.org. It's a website within Teachers College Columbia that I started and I'm the director of. It, um, is, it's, it's, the point is to have a link between the research, the law, and the clinical practice. Regularly gets 25,000 visits a month from over 120 countries, which is very surprising when I started. But what I do with this website is to build capacity and share resources about evidence-based practice in speech language disability evaluations. And also my other area that I do a lot of work with is uh, cleft palate speech therapy. Uh, I am trilingual in Spanish, French, and English, and I do share materials. I make sure try to a lot of the materials are in various languages. Everything is in Spanish. Virtually everything is also in Mandarin. Um, and then there's other languages, of course. On this website, everything is free. There's no hidden charges or upcharges. It is supported by private foundations and some funding from the provost office here at Columbia. These are my current lab workers. They're all second, first and second year graduate students at Teachers College, Columbia University. Um, and they work diligently with me to create these uh, various uh, resources. Uh, Kristen Guest is a TC graduate student who graduated from our program 10 years ago, who has been working with me on Leaders Project since she was in her first semester here. Here's a picture of the people in my lab. I also wanted to give a shout out to Tina Young, who's a bilingual Mandarin English SLP, who um, has been working with me since she was a student as well, on illustrating the SLAM materials, the school age language assessment materials. So this presentation focuses on evidence-based practice in disability evaluations. It's going to show what the law and research shows and then how to move forward to have evidence-based practice in disability evaluations with a particular focus on language sampling, elicitation, and analysis. So let's step back for a second and say, what is our role as evaluators in speech language disability evaluations. What are we meant to be doing? Now, one of the things that like eh, kills my ears is when people say, I got to go test this kid. I got to go test this student. I'm testing him. Testing is not mentioned in the law at all. We are evaluating, assessing, and evaluating students to determine whether a disorder, and then the team determines whether there's a disability. That's what we're meant to be doing, assessing and evaluating to make a differential diagnosis. These kids come to us, they're referred to us because they're having some kind of trouble. And our job, often in the classroom, and our job is to identify whether it's a true disorder, whether it's some kind of a difference, cultural, linguistic difference, sociolinguistic difference, or there's academic gaps that can be filled. Um, um, one of uh, the great researchers in African-American English is uh, Jana Oding in uh, Louisiana, Dr. Jana Oding. And she talks, of, she and now her um, grad doc students talk about a disorder within a difference, meaning being able to identify a disorder within speakers of varieties of English other than general American English within a difference. Um, I tend to say it could be a combination, but I just wanted to mark that. I am going to be speaking about general American English. So um, it means the same as standard American English, mainstream American English, or newscasters English. But I want to use general American English. I think it's the best term to use. And I've moved away from my fossilized standard American English, so that may pop up here and there. 
Our job is to figure out this, what's going on with this student, to tease out that differential diagnosis, to identify why that student is having trouble. Let's say this student is having trouble with reading comprehension. The question for the evaluator is, why? What are the roots of this comprehension issue? So it might be a gap, an academic gap, a prior knowledge gap. There might be weak academic skills, lack of prior exposure to various concepts that are expected for the child to have when they come into school. Lack of adequate instruction had been in poor educational settings, either um, in, uh, in the years prior or just the prior year, um, maybe or maybe in the current year. Maybe there's uh, English as a new language that might be general American English as a new variety of English. So the student may have acquired the variety of English in his community and home. However, when he comes to school, there's a new variety of English and he has to learn that as well as learn content. Is it a true disability? Is it something else, some kind of trauma, some kind of issue that we haven't yet identified? Or is it a combination of any of these? So it could be a linguistic or, or issue like a phonological problem, like a morphological problem, like a syntax problem, like a semantics problem. It could be that. It could be a sociolinguistic and cultural differences. So what the child brings to the school is not what the school expects the children are going to bring to the school. Could be cognition. Could be a, um, an intellectual disability. It could also be um, attending issues. It could be ADD, ADHD, it could be memory, short-term or long-term. There's many issues, executive function problems, that all of these we need to figure out what's actually going on. Could be physical factors. For example, the child needs hearing aids, the child needs glasses, the child needs uh, to sit in the front, to be in the center, to be able to hear what's going on. It could be mental illness. It could be trauma suffered by the family or that child. It could be death disease in the family, or it could be prior knowledge. Are they expected to know things that they don't know? And there's gaps that need to be filled. So all of these, when we're an evaluator, we have to say, what is actually going on? Why is the student having problems understanding reading? In addition, we have to pull apart the strands for skilled reading the strands that are woven into skilled reading. This is by Hollis Scarborough in 2001. So here she pulls apart language comprehension. There's background knowledge. Um, I can just tell you briefly, when I took the LSATs to get into law school, I'm also a lawyer of practice law, um, there was two passages, reading comprehension, well, there were more than two on my LSATs. And one was about Ella Fitzgerald. Well, Ella Fitzgerald, I've loved her music. I know her music and I love jazz. So when I saw the passage about Ella, I was like, took a deep breath, relaxing breath, scanned it to make sure there were no tricks, and then answered all the questions. Another passage was about the viscosity of the lava flow in Hawaii. Well, the truth is, I did not know what viscosity meant. And I spent a lot of time trying to make inferences and problem solve on what viscosity meant. I didn't do a great job, I don't think. But it took so much more time and my comprehension was so much more limited because I didn't have exposure to the lava flow in Hawaii and would know the word viscosity. In 2003, I was invited to Hawaii to speak uh, at the speech, uh, Hawaiian Speech Language Hearing Association Convention, one of my best, best uh, presentation opportunities ever. I brought my daughter. Afterwards, we ended up going to the Big Island and we watched and learned about the viscosity of the lava flow. So that goes to background knowledge and also vocabulary. Sentence structures, language structures. Does the student have the syntax and the semantics, the deep knowledge of semantics to understand what's meant in the passage? Um, for example, I have a friend, my friend Luis Roquelme, and he and his husband, Carlos, invited me over to their house for what he said was, why don't you come by on New Year's Eve? We'll have the remnants of the coquille. Well, in my mind, I've been many places in the world, and I've eaten many different things. But when I thought about the coqui, which to me was the little teeny frog that I've never actually seen, but I've heard many, many nights in Puerto Rico, coqui, 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 this beautiful sound. And I thought, the remnants of the coqui, I thought, 
that's not really something. Well, I love Luis. I love Carlos. I'll see what happens. Well, of course, when I got there, it turns out Coqui is also Puerto Rican eggnog. So they weren't inviting me to drink the remnants of a teeny frog from Puerto Rico. Um, then verbal reasoning. Do they have the ability to make inferences, to make meaningful predictions, to problem solve? Because that's what we're doing all the time for skilled readers. That's what I explained to you I was doing about the viscosity of the lava flow, trying to figure it out. Of course, metaphor, these are all um, metaphor and idiomatic expressions are very culturally based. And they're learned by exposure, but you have to be in the right culture. Um, so anybody who uses metaphor to identify a disability when they don't know whether the child has exposure to those idiomatic expressions or those metaphors, you, um, I would question that approach. And finally, literacy knowledge, which is also taught. Print concepts, genre, that kind of thing. You learn that. And that will help you understand the passages. Word recognition is something different from comprehension, which is phonological awareness, which is decoding and sight recognition, so sight words. Now, if a student does not, ha, might have good language skills, but they're having great trouble with phonological awareness and decoding, and those are the strands they're missing, they might struggle so much to read the individual words that they have no ability to also take into account what those words are telling, that comprehension. So if a student is having language comprehension issues, these, each of these strands has to have, must be explored to determine whether the child has a problem in any of the strands that needs to be addressed. And only with that do we get to skilled reading, which would also include reading comprehension. Let's turn to the federal law. The federal law, IDEA, sets the minimum standard for disability evaluations nationwide. Now, every state in the union takes money from the federal government for special education under IDEA. And those states have to meet the standard or exceed it. Uh, in, that's just the law in order to take that money. So what does the law require? It requires that the assessment materials, the evaluation materials must be valid and reliable. And if you look, as I said, the law never uses the word test. It only uses evaluation materials, assessment materials. Please change your, your way of speaking about what you're doing with a student when you're looking to determine whether there is a disorder. I am going to assess and evaluate the student, not I'm going to test the student. Under IDEA, all students are entitled to an evaluation. Listen to this. With evaluation materials selected and administered so as not to be discriminatory on a racial or cultural basis. Not to be discriminatory. That is a huge, huge challenge. Evaluators must gather relevant functional, developmental, and academic information. Now let's think about if the evaluation materials you're using gather fu functional, developmental, and academic information. And of course, there must be a parent interview. And <laughs> these are big challenges. All students are entitled to an evaluation with evaluation materials that can distinguish a disability from lack of adequate instruction in reading, lack of adequate instruction in math, and from limited English proficiency. So think about why that child is having difficulty with reading comprehension. The strands of Hollis Scarborough um, that she talked about to get to reading proficiency and also the boxes that I went through with you, how do you get to reading comprehension and what might be the issues. Is there a lack of adequate instruction in reading in that? What does the research tell us about standardized tests? There is a long-standing and growing and growing and growing body of research showing the problems with using standardized tests to identify a language disorder. This started in the groundbreaking work of Macaulay and Swisher in 1984, which is almost 40 years ago. Then on and on issues of validity, issues of bias that are just embedded into the standardized language tests and vocabulary tests that people are using. The research tells us that the standardized language test that most clinicians are using, and I'll show you that research, has serious validity problems, have cultural and racial biases, and cannot distinguish a language disorder from lack of adequate instruction in reading or math or from limited English proficiency. So why are we using these standardized language tests to try to identify a language disorder? 
based on the research over decades, the Omnibus Standardized Language Test, the SELF, the TELD, the TOLD, the PLS, the SELF-P, the, um, uh, gosh, uh, CASEL, the OWLS, they do not meet the evaluation standards set by IDEA 2004. So what's happening in the real world of current clinical practice in speech language disability evaluations? What does the research tell us about the real world? Betts et al. in 2013 surveyed SLPs to find out what factors influence their decision to select a particular assessment instrument to identify a specific language impairment. And they found most SLPs use the omnibus language test itself, the PLS, the self, the PDLs, the CASEL, the TOL, the TEL, and single word vocabulary test, the PPBT, the expressive one word, the receptive one word, et cetera. When asked why they selected a certain test, so hoping, well, I found that this test had the highest discriminant accuracy have kids from this particular background, and uh, I looked at the research and it's consistent with what they're doing. Oh, well, the only factor, the only test characteristic that correlated with frequency of use was publication date, meaning when whatever test they were using came out with a new version, that's when they bought the next test. That's how they chose the test, based on the newest version of the test they are most comfortable with. These findings indicate that validity, reliability, discriminant accuracy were not associated with the reasons SLPs identified for using a particular test. The use of longstanding tests might save time, we might be comfortable with it, it might not take long to learn, yet it can prevent SLPs from using tests based on cutting edge research. So when you think about it, why do SLPs use vocabulary tests? And this is true not for the people that finished school 50 years ago or 40 years ago or 30 years ago. This is even recent grads. What they found was that the cutting edge research when these tests came out is no longer cutting edge. It's cutting edge 30, 40, 50 years ago. So think about vocabulary tests. Why do we give vocabulary tests? Well, 30, 40, 50 years ago, the idea was that all students in the United States were expo exposed to the same number of vocabulary words, the same amount of frequency. So if we were to test for IQ or we were to test, were to t test assess for a language disorder, all we'd have to do is give this corpus of vocabulary words. And if they knew them, they didn't have a language disorder. And if they fell, didn't do well, they had a language disorder, high IQ, low IQ, that. However, what we've learned over a few decades now is that vocabulary learning, that labeling task that we do in the PPBT, the express one word, the perceptive one word, is highly correlated with parents' education and socioeconomic status. So we can't expect that every kid across the United States is going to have the same exposure to the vocabulary words in the corpus on those vocabulary tests. 40, 50 years ago, that was cutting edge. It's no longer what about the uh, use of morphology of general American English? So if you dive into whatever omnibus language test you might be using for your evaluations and look at how often students are correctly uh, uh, identified as correct if they've acquired Brown's morphemes, if they've acquired the morphemes of general American, the morphosyntax of general American English, the possessive S, the copulae, the auxiliary B, the possessive, I said the possessive S, the S on the third person singular. How many times? It's constant. Why? Because 30 years ago, the research came out showing that with general American English, there were certain markers morphological markers that were not there with kids with specific language impairment. Now, over time, we know that kids speak many varieties of English and we don't want to identify them as having a disorder by the varieties of English that they act, uh, appropriately learned in their school and community. But many of the tests, these omnibus language tests, use dialect. That is, has the child learned general American English to identify a disorder? Talk about implicit bias. Any evaluator who uses a test to identify disability without 
being able to analyze its psychometric integrity is doing a disservice to the students they evaluate. It's, your, it's our responsibility as evaluators. So I would say, do you all know what is the reference standard for sensitivity and specificity in the test you're using? Even just what's the sensitivity and specificity, but you've got to dig deeper than that. Is it appropriate? For example, the self five, the sensitivity is students, this is the reference standard, meaning how did we identify which students would be put in our group of students who have a disorder, our sensitivity group. They had to have scores at 1.5 standard deviations below the mean or lower on any language test, and they had to be receiving services. Specificity, they had to not be receiving services. Well, we know from Spalding, Plant, and Farinella that using an arbitrary cutoff score does not ensure accuracy across tests. And Christine Delegan in 2004, 2007, her book, if you want to know about evidence-based practice, that's the book to get, recommends that sensitivity and specificity groups share the same reference standard. Now, we can't, this takes me about five weeks in my assess and evaluate class to have my graduate students understand all of these concepts and be able to then apply them to uh, standardized omnibus tests because I want them to have that expertise. But um, so we have at leadersproject.org, we have test reviews of many of the most widely used omnibus language tests. We can read a lot more about this if you don't have that knowledge already. But anyway, a synthesis of the discriminant accuracy problems with the reference standards used for the self five sensitivity and specificity groups. The self five sensitivity group would likely to include, is likely to include typically developing students, because we don't know about the accuracy of that cutoff, except it's not accurate. The specificity group is likely to have kids with disabilities who have not been diagnosed or evaluated. The reference standards are not identical, as recommended by Delegan, and we do not have any information about the underlying psychometric integrity of the language test used to identify the sensitivity group. Now, I will tell you that the predominant test used to identify the sensitivity groups is the self-4. And I have to say, if the self-4 is so good to be your discriminant accuracy for your next self-5, just don't create the self-5. <laughs> anyway, please go to leadersproject.org for more information on this. So I drew this. It's, you know, here's the, the reference standard. It's just a very wobbly and the entire enormous omnibus self-5 is built on this wobbly, wobbly foundation. This does not mean to use a different standardized test. Too many Facebook posts ask, I'm not happy with the fill in the blank of any standardized omnibus language test. What do you like? Then a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch, put up names of tests they like, mostly followed by exclamation points, or and and or say it's fast and easy to give. That should not be your standard for a good test. Asking other clinicians what they do is not evidence-based practice on Facebook without understanding why do you like it? What's the validity? What's the discriminant accuracy? What about the bias with these kids that I see? Does it distinguish a language disorder from some, you know, lack of adequate instruction? We've so far been focused on the construct validity issues with the omnibus language test. But can a student's cultural and linguistic background of socioeconomic status affect the diagnostic accuracy of a particular test? Yes, diagnostic accuracy, which is the ability of that particular test instrument to identify a language disorder, a true language disorder, is affected by the cultural and linguistic background of the child and student being assessed. So this is just a few of the many, many articles. Socioeconomic background also plays a role. And you look at the Hart and Risley work starting in 1985 showing that, but we have much more recent research on that as well. What about for students who speak varieties of English other than general American English? Why can't we use one of our standardized omnibus language tests to identify a disorder? Virtually all omnibus language tests assess whether the student has acquired the morphosyntax of general American English. The only assessment that's different is the DEL, the Developmental Evaluation of Language Variations, which is dialect neutral. And what about our typically developing native English speakers who've acquired the language variety of their home and community? They don't have a disorder. They may be having problems in the classroom, but an evaluator has to figure that out. Are scoring modifications for English dialects and tests like the self five, uh, four and five effective? 
In these modified scoring, students get credit for responses that are grammatical within their dialects, their varieties of English, but not in general American English. So in general American English, that S at the end of the third person singular present tense is obligatory. In general American English, the copula is obligatory between he and fine. That holds that spot. And in general American English, the apostrophe S to, to note possessive is obligatory. In a number of varieties of English, that S is non-obligatory. Why? Because we already know it's third person singular. We don't need that S to tell us because we have it from the he. Also, we don't need the copula to mark the existence because it's already there in he fine in the word order. And finally, similarly, in possessive, baby's mother, the baby's mother. In many varieties of English, you don't need the apostrophe X because the baby coming before the mother in the word order marks um, possession. So are they effective? No. In the self fourth, this is a beautiful article by Hendricks and Adolf, the modified scoring so imagine this, when you give modified scoring and you're assessing a student, you say, okay, he cook, they said, he cooked. it's okay, because they speak a variety of English. He fine, other than general American English, he fine, that's okay, baby mother. But you're giving credit as if they had the markers for present tense, as if they had the mark, so other markers. You're not assessing what kind of things they would have to acquire in their variety of English. You're just giving them correct scores. So when you use scoring modifications, you miss a lot of kids who truly have a disorder because they're just getting correct, correct, correct because they, you know that they speak a variety of English, but you're not assessing whether they've acquired that variety of English. And then for the specificity, meaning does it accurately identify the kids who don't have a disorder, if you use, don't use scoring modifications for the self, guess what? more typically developing kids are going to be identified as having a disorder. So it has specificity problems. So the scoring modifications don't work. And using the self to identify a disorder for kids who have exposure to any other variety of English or other language other than standard American, general American English, is, is, gives you diagnostic inaccuracy. With these fundamental flaws in the diagnostic accuracy of standardized omnibus language tests and our professed interest in evidence-based practice, we would expect that few would be using these tests today, right? Yet a recent study found 97%, in 97% of cases, a standardized omnibus language test was used to guide clinical decision-making. And they also found, this is Fulcher Rood, one of my favorite researchers, about 30% of SLPs do not use a language sample. Now we're going to look at what is evidence-based practice in disability evaluations in Module 2.